Hi, my name is Amber Semerow, and you're listening to the Homeschool Success Stories podcast, where I interview homeschool moms. So today, my interview is with Cheryl Trasco. She is a certified teacher. She's taught school in the public schools for many years. Her husband is also a public school teacher, and um, she also has worked with many, many homeschoolers. So she's got a lot of really great information to, to share. Some of it is not uh, going to be uh, what, what we want to hear as a people about some of the things that happen in our schools. Um, but uh, I think you're really going to enjoy this episode and her approach and the things that she's done with her own kids, as well as, well, just lots of amazing experiences. Let's get started then. So why don't you just introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you decided to homeschool. Okay, so my name's Cheryl Trasco, and I have a lot of reasons for homeschooling, which I think is true of most people. Part of it is I was homeschooled for a couple of years while I was a child. We were traveling, and um, there are no schools at sea, so we had to um, homeschool. And I decided, I knew then that homeschooling was the best education I'd gotten. There was a lot less wasted time, especially when I went back and transitioned from homeschooling to a school. I was shocked at how much wasted time there is, how much time you just sit and wait in schools. And I thought, why should kids have to go through that? Um, Yeah. How old were you when you uh, were homeschooled? I was homeschooled starting at age six. Okay. And so did your family, were you living on a boat or? We were living on a boat. My dad had built a boat. We were sailing from Australia, which is where we lived at the time, Mm -hmm. tending to sail the world. Wow. Uh, Yeah. That's awesome. So did you end up sailing the world? We ended up sailing as far as Florida. Wow. That's still pretty quite far. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Two thirds of the way. so. So how long were you on the boat? Uh, a little over two years. Okay, so from about ages six to eight. Mm-hmm, and then when you got to Florida, you went to school. When we, went to, when we got to the States, yeah, I ended up going to school here. Um, and I did well enough, I ended up valedictorian in my wow, that's large good. public high school. And I don't think it was um, in spite of homeschooling, I think it was because of homeschooling. Oh, interesting. So how do you think that helped you? Because that's even just two years for your own personal. So it taught me to learn on my own. It taught me to be um, an independent learner. My mother had not planned to teach us herself. Mm -hmm. She had actually planned to bring a uh, trained teacher with us. And they did bring a trained teacher along. But once the teacher was on board, she was like, oh, no, uh, this is a vacation. I'm on vacation mode. And so she never even talked to me, let alone did any (laughs) lessons or whatever. Wow. Um, So eventually my mother, who was very intimidated, she only had a high school diploma. She thought she couldn't possibly teach. Uh, But she finally decided, well, I can do a better job than somebody who does nothing. Yeah. uh, And, you know, my parents had bought lesson materials that they Mm -hmm. were expecting the teacher to use. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things I think is they had bought materials for everything except math. Um, They did not buy math because just like today, how a lot of people have issues with common core math, Mm -hmm. well, back then, new math and my parents Mm. had issues with the new math. And so my dad was of the opinion that, well, elementary school math, you don't need a book to teach that, you know. Um, <laughs> so they had bought everything except that. So my mother taught me everything except math. My dad was in charge of math. Nice. Um, and the way that my mother taught, because she was very busy, she, mm-hmm. had, she had a newborn at the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, plus I had a younger sister and she's cooking for everybody on the boat. Yeah. Wow. So her method of teaching was just, okay, there are lessons here. They have a packet for each week. 
I'll give you the packet on Monday. I want you to do the lessons it says for Monday. If you've got questions, come find me and ask me. Mm -hmm. um, and so it worked for me. It probably wouldn't have worked for every kid, but uh, I learned to read the directions and figure out how to follow them and do the stuff on my own. Uh, and that was an immense help in all of my education. Yeah. And then my dad, his math lessons were a little unique. Um, his method was, okay, you know how to add and subtract, so we're going to work on multiplication. And so he would give me a list that he wrote out of some facts. And he would say, go copy these 100 times. <laughs> and um, I would copy them 100 times. Wow, you were a and diligent little student. <laughs> well, he... He started with something that to me as a kid made sense. Mm -hmm. He started by explaining. He said, you know, math at your level is kind of boring. And he said, yeah. there's just no way around that. He said, but you learn it well and you can do all sorts of fabulous things with mm. it. And then he compared it to someone who was learning to be a carpenter. And they had to start by learning to use a hammer mm -hmm. with a nail. Mm -hmm. And he said, learning to hammer is boring, but if you can't hammer that nail in correctly, you're not going to be able to build the big, wonderful stuff. Mm -hmm. He had built our boat himself, so mm -hmm. I figured he knew what he was talking about. Yeah, and yeah. So I was willing to go along with the program because he explained it to me. Yeah. And I found with my own kids that sometimes explaining things mm -hmm. in a way that we don't usually think of talking to our children mm -hmm. difference. For example, my youngest right now is seven mm -hmm. and his handwriting is atrocious mm -hmm. and I'll make him rewrite things and rewrite things and it still looks awful. Yeah. So I sat him down a few days ago and I'm like, you know, the reason you're doing this, the reason you're learning this is because someday you're going to be a grown up. And you're going to need to be able to write in a grown-up way. People are going to need to be able to read what you write. And you're practicing now for that. And if you keep practicing it badly, you're going to be a grown-up who can't write well. Mm -hmm. And he thought about it for a while. And mm -hmm. then he came and he had the most beautifully written stuff. Um, I'm going to try that with my seven-year-old. My seven-year-old has a has, we're working on writing too. That's a good one. <laughs> so, you know, I will, I will say that it wasn't the first time we'd had this conversation, uh -huh. but it finally took. So, yeah, you know. yeah. Um, so, well, that is, so, yeah. That's, I, I found that too. Like explaining the bigger picture really helps a lot of times because it is kind of drudgery. Right. And for me, you know, as a, as a child, um, because I believed in what he was saying, I was willing to go along with it. And his method was write him a hundred times. Then I had to come to him when he wasn't busy and he would give me a quiz. His quizzes were always oral. He'd say a problem, like he might say three times four. Mm -hmm. And if I didn't give the problem, he would snap his fingers right after he said it, three times four, snap. And mm -hmm. if I hadn't said the right answer, by the time he snapped his fingers, I had to go write it another 100 times. <laughs> Incredibly boring. But I'll tell you, I learned those facts well. Yeah. Um, and I ended up majoring in math. That's what wow. my degree was getting. Wow. And I don't think it was despite him. I think I came with a really solid foundation. Yeah. So even when I came back into schools, I was shocked when even in like sixth grade, kids were still working on learning those basic facts and struggling yeah. in math because of it. Yeah. Um, whereas I was like, oh, this is, got this. Let's move yeah. on. Let's yeah. get to the interesting stuff. Yeah. So, interesting. Um, wow. Right. So have so, you implemented mm -hmm. that? And I will, we'll probably talk about that later, but real quick, have you implemented, have you done the same thing with your kids? once <laughs> my daughter was complaining and complaining years ago uh, because I was having her work on basic facts she didn't have them down and I actually she had finished a third grade math curriculum and we had tried fourth grade and it was clear that she needed to work more on those facts and was struggling because of it so we took time off to work on that 
-hmm. and she was complaining about it. So one day I said, okay, let's do it grandpa's way. And she, I didn't, I don't think she even got the first three problems copied a hundred times. And then she's like, please, can we go back to the other way? I won't complain <laughs> anymore. So that's what I used it for. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> so, that's good. Yeah. Um, and she didn't. So, you know, it worked. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so you went back to the States and just did regular school the rest of the time, I right. guess, and right. did well, but you had just a really good foundation. I had a good foundation, and, you know, I had learned to be independent. I had learned to read well. I got a solid foundation in math, and that's really what made the difference. Mm -hmm. And as far as my dad's math lessons, he thought the only math he was teaching me were the basic facts with his stuff. But I think looking back that he taught me a lot more than he realized because he was um, using an old fashioned sextant and a huge book of trigonometric tables. Oh, and every day he would go out and at exactly noon, he would use his sextant to take a site and then he'd do calculations and he'd figure out where we were. And so I, I saw math like this going on mm -hmm. and it made me think this math stuff is pretty useful stuff. It's yeah. very powerful. Yes. I want to learn it. And one of the things I've gotten out of that with my own kids is getting them to want to learn it is really the mm -hmm. essence of what I need to do as a homeschool parent. Yeah. If they want yeah. to learn it, they'll learn it right that's that's the trick right there <laughs> right and sometimes the desire and the curiosity and yeah right um so did your did your parents did you guys just stay in florida or did you end up oh I mean, no we, we my parents traveled a lot so okay we were i was gonna say it's so gone and then and just <laughs> yeah no we were we were constantly traveling when i was a kid so and you asked about why I homeschool, and I would say that's that's part of the reason, mm -hmm. but a big other part of it is I became a teacher myself. And being in the classroom and seeing what's really going on in schools today mm -hmm. made me even more convinced I don't want my kids anywhere near this. Yeah. It's not what it should be. It's not what people often think it is mm. what's represented to the public isn't really what goes on mm. so what did you what were you trained for and what did you teach i was trained i was a math teacher however and what grade? i taught um i have taught everything from sixth grade to pre -k. oh okay but i also have taught lots of other things it was the perfect training for being a homeschool parent <laughs> um, you don't need to be I a teacher. bet, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I taught biology and anatomy and physiology for the Department of Defense. I've taught reading. I've taught study skills. I, I've taught pretty much everything wow. in the middle and high school levels. Okay. So this was before you had kids? This was before four kids, yes. Okay. And so how so, old are your kids now? And how long have you homeschooled them the whole time? Yes, they have always been homeschooled. So my oldest is 19. I have an 18-year-old and a 7-year-old. And so the 19-year-old is graduated. He graduated in January. Mm -hmm. And he is now in boot camp with the Marines. And my middle child just graduated this week. And she has already completed a year of college. Basically, her last year of homeschooling was her first year of high. Oh, was her first year of college. Great. Um, and so she's set to just continue on that way. And then, obviously, my youngest is still homeschooling. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, so do you want to talk about your approaches or that you used for your homeschool? Mm -hmm. Let's go back a step. Let's sure. um, talk about what in the schools was probably really pushed you over the edge into homeschooling. Mm -hmm. What sorts of things you saw that were not right. what people think it is. So I, for, there were so many things that I saw and, and my husband is also a public school teacher. So he mm -hmm. saw these as well. Um, a big one is bullying. Mm. My husband, a few years ago, 
was sent to an all-day seminar. He was taken out of his classroom. They put a substitute in, sent him. And the reason they sent him, and various other teachers as well, was he had written up a detention slip for a kid that he caught in the cafeteria demanding lunch money from a smaller boy. To my way of thinking, if you're demanding lunch money from a, a detention is like a piddly little yeah. punishment, you know, they, they right. should get more, especially because the younger boy said this, this bully had been taking his lunch money multiple times on previous occasions. This was not the first time. So my husband was sent to this all day seminar and they never came right out and said it in so many words, but they basically told all the teachers there, do not notice bullying. We don't want any, any written records of bullying because our schools don't have a bullying problem. And if you put something in writing, then we have a bullying problem. If you keep noticing this, if you write it down, we're going to transfer you to the worst school in the district. So, so yeah, that's, that's like, very, what in the world? Like, what? Why? That makes no sense. So it's all about PR. You know, schools mm. want to look good. Yeah. They want a nice surface. Uh, you look at the surface, everything looks great and wonderful because yeah. yeah. we have no reports of bullying. Right. Um, and in the meantime, teachers are getting in trouble if they notice things. So parents wonder why teachers don't do anything. Yeah. There's this pressure on them not yeah. to. Not to um, mention the poor kids being bullied. <laughs> right. Well, and another thing, the biggest thing for me was in uh, – my next to the last year of teaching in the public schools, I had a kid in one of my classes pull a gun on another kid. Oh my goodness. That in your right. class? In my class. I'm oh, teaching, I'm boy. teaching algebra. I've just taught a lesson. I was helping one student, you know, with a problem. I stand up as I normally did. I surveyed the classroom to see, okay, what's going on? Anybody else need help? And in the opposite corner, he's got a gun out, the pistol pointed at the head of the kid sitting oh across the aisle from him. And this was, this was a while ago. This was um, the year after Columbine. So, you know, that's all oh. going through my head. Yeah. And so we weren't trained for this, you know. No. You just on the fly trying to figure out what to do. So my thought was, I don't want to end up on the news with all these kids dead. Yeah. Uh, you know. How scary. So I'm going to try to get him out of the classroom. My door would lock automatically. If I got him out, he'd be out. Yeah. Um, and I figured I'm going to try to talk him out. I figured if I end up dead, at least I'll keep the kids from, you know. So that's, um, so I managed to talk him into pointing the gun down and walking out. I just kept telling him over and over, basically, you know, I don't know what's going on here, but you don't want to ruin the rest of your life this way. Don't make this such a big deal. Let's, let's go out and talk about it. So I got the administration. They came, took him away. The next day, I got called into the principal's office. They put a sub in my room and had a meeting that they wanted me to attend about his punishment. Uh, I was so traumatized. I wasn't thinking clearly at the time. But later, looking back, I can see they were covering up is what they were doing. Because they never tell teachers what they do as punishment. That's just, they always tell you it's none of your business, you know. Yeah. Um, we'll handle it. But they called me in and they started You do the dirty me, work and we'll do Kina. whatever we want. Right. <laughs> So they tried to tell me how he was not going to be punished, as you would think, because this wasn't really a gun. In the one conversation, their story changed three times. Initially, they told me that it was a um, BB gun. Then they told me it was an air gun. Then they told me, it was a lighter that looked like a gun. So they couldn't keep their story straight. Yeah. And never um, mind all the freak outs for, you know, water guns and stuff. Right. When there's exactly. actually a real gun. Right. 
Oh, so, we don't want to talk about that. What state was this in, if you don't mind my asking? This is in Florida. Florida, okay. Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, they wanted to, they, they didn't even suspend him. He was still at school. Wow. Um, they How just, traumatic for It everyone. was very. But what I know is that I've known lots of other teachers who've had different things happen in their classroom mm -hmm. and schools do everything they can to cover it all up if it's possible. Because otherwise um, they look bad. They look bad. They lose funding. It doesn't matter whether they're public or private because uh -huh. I've worked in both. It mm -hmm. happens in both. If they're private, you know, people pull their kids out of the school, they lose tuition dollars. Yeah. If they're public, their, their ratings go down. They don't get as much money from the yeah. state. Plus kids are pulled out of the school and they lose money. So, yeah. Um, wow. So to us, like that's the biggest thing is I want my kids safe. Yeah. And I can't trust them to do that. Yeah. I know there are lots of incidents that never get reported. And so right. the schools that parents think are safe, probably aren't as safe as they think they are. So do you think this is the case even in uh, like suburban areas? So this is I've worked in, I've worked in a lot of schools. I'll uh -huh. tell you, I've worked in so many schools. And part of the reason is I would get fed up with what would go on in one school. And I think, Oh, it's just this administration. I'll go to a new school, mm. I'll get a new administration. Everything will be better. So I've worked in inner city schools. I've worked in suburban. I've worked in private in both. I've even worked in a school run by the Department of Defense for uh, military dependents. Mm -hmm. um, and what I saw is they all do a lot of the same things. Really? Wow. The, the ones that are suburban cover up more. Um, you know, for example, mm -hmm. I've been in schools where you know, you report, oh, it looks like this kid's high. Could you come, you know, mm -hmm. do something? And uh, the administration's like, yeah, yeah, sure. We'll, we'll call him out. You just keep him in class. We'll, we'll take care of it later. And then they wait till the next day. Well, obviously, the effects are gone. Right, you know? right. Yeah. And oh, if I can fine. tell, yeah, he's fine. <laughs> and if I can tell just from looking at him, I'm not a very, um, right. I was never on that edge. So if yeah. I can tell, you know, there's something serious. It, it's, pretty, it's pretty obvious by that right. point. <laughs> right. So. Wow. Okay. Well, <laughs> that answers that question. That, that's, a, that's a hard thing, I think, for people to hear. But, you know, we're not going to make changes if we're not willing to look at the problems, right? Right. And to me, you know, I've heard a lot of people who say, well, let's, let's fight within the system to change mm -hmm. it and such. Mm -hmm. But my, my, my thinking is my children should not be the guinea pigs yeah. to sit yeah. there and deal with it until yeah. it's figured out. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, I agree. Um, wow. Uh, that's just sobering. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and that, you know, yeah, I mean, safety, if, if the kids aren't in a safe environment, it doesn't matter how good, your curriculum is or your teachers because if you're not safe you can't learn and that's right that's just a fact so mm -hmm. so that was uh, for you the biggest thing safety that's the biggest right yeah um, is there anything else you want to touch on with that before we move on to what you've done in your homeschool the only other thing I would say is standards have just dropped so mm. much I've been I've started teaching in 1986 mm -hmm. so you know and what I have seen is that the standards have just gone down and down and down over the mm -hmm. years and that's another reason why I teach at home yeah I've yeah. seen that um, kids who are homeschooled because I, I one of the things that I do is I do evaluations in Florida um, every year those who homeschool by telling the school district that's what they're doing, have to have an evaluation. So mm -hmm. I see what lots of different homeschool parents do, mm -hmm. and what they do compared to what would a te what a student would actually be learning if they were in the classroom, mm -hmm. it's night and day. Yeah. Um, my my two older children took college classes while they were in high school, mm -hmm. and all their professors said. 
they can tell the difference between the homeschooled kids and the schooled kids because the homeschooled kids have a better foundation. Their parents mm -hmm. don't just let them slide along. They don't mm -hmm. say, oh, you got this wrong, but you got to see, let's just move on. Right. They say, oh, let's make sure you get this. Yeah, you don't move on until it's learned. Right, and yeah. that makes a huge difference in yeah. learning. So. Yeah. Okay, yeah, well, those are, yeah, super good reasons. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess, yeah, you've seen a lot of approaches. So is there anything out there that, that you've seen not work? The thing that? that I've seen not work is when parents use some kind of a program, with, usually online, and they just keep hands off and they mm. don't check in on their kids. Mm. So, for example, I've seen quite a few parents who will use um, an online school like Florida Virtual School mm -hmm. and their child will tell them, oh, yes, I'm doing great. I'm doing fine. But they don't actually yeah. check up. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the year, they go and they find out they never actually started most of these classes. Oh, gosh. Um, so, I know. Yeah. That's kids for you. You just say <laughs> <laughs> follow up, follow up, follow up. Because, right. yeah. And that's, you know, and that's probably the hardest part I've found, you know, in the teaching part is mm -hmm. keeping up and checking right out. but yeah you can let your kids be independent i've done that but you still check up you yeah. know you still yeah. like oh, you're like show me how you it's just doing. look at that notebook right let me see <laughs> what you've been doing right. and what what have you been reading what what was that about how did you write like that yeah it doesn't have to take long right um, and that's what i've always told people what what i'm convinced is that homeschooling is the best education for those who are willing to put in the time and effort. Yeah. So if you're not willing to put in the time and effort or not able to put in the time and effort, yeah. then it's not going to work yeah. for you. Yeah. Cause it does take, it does take a lot of involvement and effort for sure. Right. You can't. Yeah. Kids, most kids, some, there are some kids, it doesn't matter what you do. They'll turn out great. Um, right. But, Probably most kids, they need follow up, they need help, they need, you know, feedback. Right. So, yeah. Okay, so what, did, what have you done in your homeschool? What have you found to be the thing that has worked for you? So, we're very eclectic. We do a bit of this and a bit of that. Um, I like a lot of unschooling methods. Mm -hmm. So, we've done a lot there. For example, every year I'll ask my kids, what do you want to learn this year? Um, and an example I often explain to people is one year my son said, he wants to learn Star Wars. And my first reaction was, that's not academic. We're <laughs> yeah. not going there. And then I stopped and I thought about it. I'm like, okay, well, maybe we can make it academic. Mm -hmm. So um, I did a lot of searching online and whatnot. Um, I found a book on arts and crafts related to Star Wars. So I'm like, okay, we can throw some art in there. Um, and then I started thinking, you know, there's a lot of science. It's science fiction. Yeah. So we talked about science fiction as, as a genre of literature. But I also went in and tackled different science ideas and researched to find out, is this science real? Mm -hmm. Is it false, made up? Is it something that might be real if the technology evolves further? Mm -hmm. um, and so I use those as lessons with them. And then my husband pointed out, he's like, look at this. A lot of the settings seem like ancient Rome and such. Yeah. So we studied some of the history and, and mm -hmm. how they just played with that to, to set things up. So, you know, that wasn't the only thing we studied that year, mm -hmm. but we did a lot of Star Wars. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure he was very interested in, in all of it. He was. Yeah. So, yeah, he learned so much more that year from science than the years when we just used books or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So, and I found that too. Like, if you can 
find something that they're really interested in and then incorporate, you know, right. Kind of what you were saying before, kind of explain why do we have to do the drudgery stuff mm -hmm. so we can get to the cool stuff. Yeah. Right. Now I do say I don't just do unschooling. I, you know, I'm like, okay, you're going to learn to read and write and whatever. So I'm going to make sure even if it's not related to something you're interested in, math is kind of hard to, just to make, make it really related fun, to their right? yeah. interests. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I, I do kind of mix it up there. But I have found, especially as they get into those teenage years, those teenage years, they want independence. Mm. Uh, mine, since they'd always been homeschooled, were like, yeah, you've been telling us what to do for years. We feel like babies when you sit here and teach us. We want Success, something. right? Success. Right, it That's is. That's what you're going for. Right. So yeah. what I did with them was I'm like, okay, how about you design some courses? Tell yeah. me what it is you want to learn. Figure out materials that you'll use. So, for example, my son, uh, we needed U.S. history because I was kind of going by – uh, public school graduation requirements. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to, but I chose to mm -hmm. just to make sure they were ready for whatever they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And so he's like, ah, I'd really like to learn through videos. Hmm. Like there are tons of videos that yeah. do with US history. So he went and he searched out videos. Occasionally I suggested some to him and he tracked his hours. He'd watch the videos. Then he'd write up a little paper on what he got out of it and show it to me um and that's how we did u.s history and that's that worked awesome. great for him yeah and then and my how old daughter, was he when you this did was that? in high school so he was like 17 yeah at that point yeah um uh, my daughter when she was maybe 13 or 14 she was like i want to really um broaden my skills with fabric and mm. i want to knitting sewing crocheting she's mm -hmm. like i want to really want want to do that so we tried to get some books none of them were very useful so she found youtube videos mm. and she watched lots of youtube videos i found some dvd series at the library and uh -huh. she watched that too and she made lots of things wow she put some cool. of them in the local um fair mm -hmm. um, and she won some awards so we wrote up a course um we called it uh Art and design, fiber mm, arts. Cool. Um, so, you know, and we put in there the awards she wanted. It looks very impressive on paper. Yeah. Um, but it was something that she figured out because that's what she wanted to do. Yeah. So. That is awesome. I love that. Um, so, uh, what, like, so that's kind of when they're older. So, how do you get them to that point? So How do you find when this independent right phase it it takes time and depends on the child i think some are ready for it sooner than others and some have to be pushed to it maybe the parent has a job or something they're working from home the child's got to be more independent so your mm -hmm. family situation can play a role in that mm -hmm. um i worked very much with my kids when they were very young we mm -hmm. did a lot of I would read aloud and we would discuss things. Mm -hmm. We didn't do a lot of paperwork when they mm -hmm. were very young. Mm -hmm. um, we were more into let's read it and talk about it, read history, talk about what happened, read science, maybe do some experiments. Mm -hmm. um, and eventually worked our way to writing. So we didn't do like the schools who push writing so early. Mm -hmm. I thought that just seemed to be counterproductive kids mm -hmm. end up hating writing whereas mm -hmm. mine ended up eventually winning writing contests and such but they wrote because um they'd reached a point where they wanted to they were starting to write their own little stories and things mm -hmm. and, and then i got more into pushing the writing yeah uh, but i i worked on building the basic skills even then i tried to make it fit their interests so mm -hmm. you know when we're teaching reading um, you know, they're interested in uh, a particular subject. They're interested in sharks, say. Mm -hmm. Get books on sharks to mm -hmm. teach them to read because they're going to go along with it a lot more. It's going to be yeah. less painful for everybody. Yes. If they yes. Like the topic. Teaching kids to read. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, 
And, you know, so, so we did that kind of thing. Um, I do say we did have some tears sometimes when they yeah. didn't want to do something. Yeah. And I just push them. But I yeah. keep reminding them, this is for you. You're going to yeah. be a grown up someday. Yeah. You got to be ready. Yeah. Well, and, you know, it's part of growing up is learning to do <laughs> things that you don't want to do, you know? So right. um, that's kind of how we are. It, you know, I have a checklist of like the basic stuff that you have to do. And I'm like, it's just mm -hmm. like brushing your teeth, combing your right. hair, eating, may, you know, cleaning up after yourself. And you got to do right. math. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry. Or no video games. And it's amazing right. how quickly, you know, if they have something to look forward to. Right. Um, and that's worked well with my boys. My girls... <laughs> It was easier. I don't know. They were just more self Girls tend to be people yeah. pleasers is what I've seen. They, they want to do what makes you happy. Yeah, that may be. Yeah. And yeah, they I, don't have the same draw to video games that my boys have. <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. know what it is. but I know with my older two, it was easier in some ways because I, even though they were a little over a year apart, we did things together. And as mm -hmm. long as I get one who'd be like, Oh yeah, I'll do this. The other would just come along and do yeah. it because it was more interesting than not being on their own. Um, with the youngest, since he's on his own, it's a little more difficult. Yeah, I, think. I bet. Yeah. We're, um, we're living with uh, my brother right now. And so my nephews are with us and we've, mm -hmm. we've been doing this little Greek program and mm -hmm. I got, um, whiteboards they each have their own whiteboards and with right. all of them doing it suddenly it's cool because right. oh, i can do that you know right so it really it really does and i found the same thing with my older ones um when they were very young i actually homeschooled my nephew for a short time and when they saw their older cousin reading and yeah. writing they yeah. wanted to jump in and do it yeah so that's something people can keep in mind is you know that's that's where homeschool groups become useful i think like right let's get together and talk about this book you know let's write mm -hmm. a let, write a short paragraph about what we read and right you know that kind of thing so yeah that is good um do you have a particular curriculum that you really like like for reading or math or I've used so many different things. I mean, I like Saxon for math in the younger grades. Mm -hmm. Okay in high school. Um, but I really like it in the younger grades. But we do, we actually do a hodgepodge of things. Like my youngest, we probably got four or five different math curricula. We just jump around because he gets bored. And I'm yeah. like, okay this one then this yeah. one so um, for you it's very much you're kind of more results oriented like you've got to right. learn how to add subtract i don't right. care how you learn it you exactly. just need to be able to do it at a certain right level right before you move on it's, right it's so when when money was tight we used a lot of cheap discount store workbooks mm -hmm. and a lots of library books mm -hmm. i know right now that's a little difficult in some areas with oh, libraries being shut down. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> um, but we did lots of those and that worked great um, now we've got more funds so we're able to just and i usually do use books anyway yeah so, uh, it's so fun to buy that. books i have a book problem but uh <laughs> But yeah, okay, so um, do you have sort of like, like how do you, I'm, you're a teacher, so mm -hmm. I guess you just kind of know, like they have to know how to read, they know, have to know how to, you know, do percentages, and you just kind of know that, or how do you gauge mm -hmm. if you're, to make sure you're covering stuff, I guess, make sure there's not any holes. One of the things that I know is that every curriculum has holes. No kid comes out of school knowing everything that they need to know. And that can be reassuring because yeah. it means if your kid has holes, they're like everybody else. Yeah. So, you know, you don't have to I love that. Be this so is so worried good. about it. Yeah. Um, what what I think is important is making sure they know how to learn. They know the mm -hmm. basics of reading and math 
and mm -hmm. such. But beyond that, they know how to learn so that if they come across a topic that they don't know, they should know how to look it up and try to figure it out, find resources, that sort of thing. I think if I've accomplished that, then it's a success. That's awesome. So, I love that. Um, that but I, I, I will say that I find if you're in there working with your kids and you're close with them, you will notice things that they need to know. Mm -hmm. You'll realize, okay, we, we read about such and such and the kids had no clue what this thing meant and it's something important. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure they learn it. Or, you know, they're doing some math and they're really stumbling over mm -hmm. this concept. Let's go back and work on it. So being involved, I think, yeah. takes a lot of that worry out. Yeah, just, yeah, because you're right there with them. Right. So you know exactly where they're at and what they should right. know and, and what they don't know and stuff. Right. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, do you have a particular schedule that you find has been better or how, what does your, what does a typical day look like? We are not the kind of people who say we're up at this time and we do this at this time. We don't have a bell schedule like schools do. Mm -hmm. um, I know some people do that, but that's not how I live my life. I'm not a, like in our house, we don't have dinner at a certain time. And mm -hmm. so that goes with our homeschooling too. Mm -hmm. um, we are more, I have um, a certain number of things I want to get done each day. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like math and reading, we do every day. Mm -hmm. And I usually try to do math early because that's usually something that um, just seems to work better earlier yeah. in the morning yeah. when they're I found that fresh. too, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Right. And then when things are normal, we have lots of activities we're going and do. Mm -hmm. um, and so usually I'm just, doing lessons in between whatever we've got going on. Yeah. So, you know, like we're part of a homeschool support group, which normally had all sorts of clubs and classes yeah. and activities. Yeah. Um, and my youngest is in Cub Scouts and, you know, yeah. so we've got things going on. Yeah. Uh, we would do a lot of lessons in the car. Mm -hmm. Audio books were a good friend because mm -hmm. um, as we're driving somewhere, oh, yeah. they're not – that, that time is wasted otherwise. They're not right. doing anything. So it's a great time to put on some classic of literature mm -hmm. or some history or, or something. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I just have goals for, I want to get math and reading every day. I want to get mm -hmm. this many history lessons in a mm -hmm. week or this much of science and just kind of plug it in where it works. When I see that the kids are really interested in something they're working on I usually just let them be and let them do that mm -hmm. for a while mm -hmm. instead of starting a fuss and a fight yeah um, part of my goal too is when they're really young I figure that a big part of my mission is to make them think education is a good thing mm -hmm. so I don't focus on doing it every day as much when they're mm -hmm. little Mm -hmm. um, because I don't want them to learn to hate education and yeah. then drag their feet yeah. um, in a battle for years to come. Yeah. So when do you start kind of having them do more, like expecting them to do it every day? And So like my seven-year-old, we're starting to get into kind of every day. Mm -hmm. um, although like today we decided not to do anyway. Yeah. Um, so it's still, I, even in the older ages, we'll take days off as we need to and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But, but but around age seven, I'm looking at maybe every day, but certainly not five and six like schools we yeah. do. Yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. And uh, do you have any organizational tips, um, how to manage the household and balance <laughs> make chores part of your homeschooling okay you know? that's good yeah <laughs> yeah involve them in it it's a lesson it's home ec or yeah. whatever oh yeah um if you don't do that you'll never keep up yeah. um and i personally have gone with the uh the kids are living in the house things are not going to be that nice yeah. and tidy um yeah. i'm going to drive myself insane if i'm trying to do that attitude. yeah yeah um i'll have plenty of time for a nice clean house once they're all 
grow. I love that. Yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. My youngest is now seven and my house is so much cleaner. <laughs> it's like, wow. <laughs> like when you don't have a million toys, it uh, really stays cleaner. So yeah. And I'm sure, you know, I do kind of miss some of that. The little right. stuff, you know, and the little mess. Right. So yeah, don't wish it away. Kind of enjoy it and enjoy it. I was thinking, talking to, to somebody else later, how a lot of what schools do is try to recreate what you learn at home. <laughs> mm -hmm. So that's where, you know, chores and stuff come in. Like, it's just part of life. It's part of life. And I'll tell you, I had a college roommate whose parents never made her do any chores. Mm. They wanted her to be a great student. They had never gotten PhDs and that was their dream and they wanted her to accomplish it. So she never had any chores. And when she got into college, she ended up dropping out for a time, not because college was too much. It was because the daily life stuff was oh, too wow. much and she couldn't keep up. Wow. She wow. ended up, she ended up moving in with a professor's family and the professor's wife taught her how to do all these daily skills and wow. manage and cope with them. And so when we became roommates, it was after this, mm -hmm. she spent a year with this college professor's wow. family. Uh, so I always look at it and say, don't think that chores aren't part of academics because if right. they don't get that, they're not going to be able to cope. Yeah. I like that. That's, that's very true. I mean, that's, mm -hmm that's part of life is you have to be able to balance everything. Right. And you've got to know how to clean your dishes and such, you know, right. she, she didn't know how to do any of that stuff. She had roaches on wow. the walls and you know, just massive wow. uh, because she didn't know what to do yeah. to clean. Up. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so overall, how do you feel like your homeschooling has turned out? I think it's turned out great. I'll tell you, my oldest, who graduated in January, he wanted to go into the military for some time. We tried to talk him out of it. <laughs> but, um, They're going to do what they want to do. So. Right, exactly. <laughs> well, we tried to talk him out of it, and then we tried to get him better prepared. Mm -hmm. um, but when he went to the Marines, which is where he's gone, he went to the and the recruiter at first was skeptical because he was homeschooled, but then had him take a practice as lab test, saw how great he did. And the next thing you know, the recruiter is trying to talk him into going to college. Oh. The recruiter's like, yeah, you should be an officer. You should not be mm -hmm. an enlisted person. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, you have to have college to be an officer. Mm. And he pushed him to try for a scholarship that was highly competitive. And he said out, outright, he was, my son was not the demographic that was looked for in the scholarship. Mm. The scholarship was meant more for people of color. Mm. Um, although it wasn't limited to them. Mm -hmm. and, but he pushed him to try for it. And as a part of the process, he had to apply to a bunch of different colleges. Mm -hmm. He had to show that he would get accepted. Mm -hmm. So every college that he finished the application process mm -hmm. with, he was accepted into. Yeah. So to me, that's one mark of yeah. he's yeah. done great. Yeah. My daughter, who did her final year of high school as a college student through a dual mm -hmm. enrollment program, she has gotten all A's this year. She's had a full load of college classes. She's been invited to their honor college program. Mm -hmm. uh, so to me, that's another mark of success. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So, and, and I see that it's not just my kids. In yeah. my area, there are so many homeschooled high school kids who are in dual enrollment classes. Mm -hmm. uh, there are, I see lots of them who actually graduate high school with two-year college degrees. Mine didn't that's awesome. That. But, you yeah. know, a lot of them do. So, yeah. Um, and I've read statistics that kids who are homeschooled 
are much more likely to actually finish college yeah. than those who are schooled. Yeah. So. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And I think uh, beyond that, uh, just the character development and the confidence and, uh, you know, the independence and the curiosity. Um, and the ability to prepare them for adult life. You know, when yeah. my son made it clear he wanted to be in the military, after we got past the trying to talk him out of it, mm -hmm. we found a way to help him prepare. So we searched around, we found an organization called the Young Marines, mm -hmm. which is kind of like scouting, mm -hmm. but with a Marine flair. That has helped him so much. It's helped him, first of all, decide, is this really what he wants before mm -hmm. he actually gets there? Mm -hmm. But then it's taught him skills and knowledge that's helped him. And I've seen that with lots of other families, not necessarily interested in the military, but whatever their child is interested in, they find a way to help yeah. really focus their education on that yeah. so that they don't end up one of these people who goes to college for four years for a particular uh, type right, of job, right. gets there, and then and says, there oh, no I hate it, or, yeah. or there are no jobs, right, or whatever. Right. Um, so to me, that's one of the best things about homeschooling. Yeah. Um, what got your son interested in going into the military? Um, that's a good question. I think, in part, I unwittingly did that. Um, <laughs> he heard stories of when I worked for the Department of Defense oh. on an Army base. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and I think that's what got him started interested mm. in the military. And then he just and likes then, it. So yeah, my husband served a, a bit in the army, and um, mm -hmm. he loved it too. Loved basic training. Right. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So what mistakes have you made, and what would you do differently? So I think in the early years, sometimes I push too much, and. You know, you, you get this mindset of, oh, they're going to learn to read now. Yeah, um, yeah. They're going to be behind. Yeah. And what I saw is sometimes, sometimes you're battling nature. They're just not really they're mature not enough for yeah. it. They're not ready. And when they are ready, it just clicks. Mm -hmm. um, but the butting heads that you do when you're trying to force them to, you know, would have yeah. been better if we didn't go there. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can relate to that too. Um, and what have you done well? What do you? Th what are some things you've done really well? I, I think, I think in asking my kids every year what they wanted to do, mm -hmm. and then even when it seemed totally something we couldn't do, we figured out a way. So, for example, one year my son, when he was a bit older, said he wanted to learn shooting. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't know how I'm going to manage that. <laughs> um, we we don't have guns in the house. Mm -hmm. we, you know, we're not that kind of family. Yeah. Um, but I found 4-H was doing training in archery. Mm. And so there were no archery groups in our area. But I went to this training and they let me bring him along since he was a teenager. Um, so he went through the training with me and we talked some other homeschooling parents into going through it. And then we started a 4-H archery group. And so we did lots of archery training and he loved it. And then eventually when he found the young teens group, they occasionally would go to shooting ranges and try mm -hmm. something. So, so we got it in there. Mm -hmm. um, but it took us some creative thinking to figure out how we would do it. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and what would you say is an absolute must do for homeschooling? What is a must do? Get them to want to learn. I think that's what people often skip. Mm -hmm. You know, like with reading, if you're just pushing books on teaching reading and you're not reading lots of things that they're interested in to them, mm -hmm. um, you're missing a lot. Mm -hmm. When my oldest was little, he didn't really seem like he wanted to read on his own. He had learned a lot of the reading skills. What I found eventually worked was I kept reading aloud to him stories that he was interested in. 
And at a really good point in the stories, I would say, oh, sorry, I got to go take care of something. And I'd leave the book there. And it took a number of times before he took the bait. I like uh, that. But eventually, he's like, okay, she's taking too long. I need to know what's happening next. <laughs> and he picked it up and started trying to read it. That's awesome. Um, but so it's that, you know, you find ways to make them want to learn mm -hmm. to do it. Yeah. And then it's much easier to teach it. I love that. That is really good advice. Um, and what is the best thing about homeschooling? It's that it's an individual education. Mm -hmm. You can make it work for them. Schools are designed like factories. You know, so mm -hmm. many schools have hundreds or thousands of kids in them and they teach them all the same things at the same time mm -hmm. and your child may not be ready for the same things at the same time yeah and your child is not going to do exactly the same thing as every other child as an adult mm -hmm. so if they can have an education that fits more their direction in life mm -hmm. that's better for them in the long run I yeah think. yeah i love that and what is the hardest part of homeschooling? You don't get that natural break every day from your kids. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. sometimes you have to find ways to create that. I know uh, for several years I was part of a ladies' bunko group that mm -hmm. would meet, and mm -hmm. my husband would watch the kids while I just got away from the house. <laughs> yeah. Filled out with some other ladies. Yeah, and um, that's important. Right. Yeah. So, and, but it's hard to do when you're, especially when you have little ones. I, yeah. I know I've gone to so many doctor's appointments for myself with kids yeah. in tow. And, yeah. And that's, that's difficult. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, how did you change over time in your homeschooling? You touched on this a little bit already, but mm -hmm. do you want to add anything? What I would add is, you know, in the beginning, I focused a little more on workbooks and things mm -hmm. than I did as we went along. I don't think I was confident enough in the beginning, mm. but also I was worried about my husband. My husband was not too sure about this unschooling mm -hmm. stuff, yeah. and he wanted paperwork to see mm -hmm. what they were doing. Yeah. So I did more to keep him happy. Mm -hmm. And basically, as the years have gone by, he's gotten more um, sure of what I'm doing. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's okay now if we yeah. don't. It's, it's nice to get to the end, isn't it? Right. To have some kids that graduate. It's like, see, right. I didn't ruin right. them. And in fact, they're right. pretty good people. Right. <laughs> You're glad to be around and have, right. you know, friendships with and stuff. So, Yeah. Okay, well, we are getting to the end here. I've just got two questions left. One is, what key things gave you success? Are there any, you've talked about some, but is there a key? You know, one of the things that I think for a lot of people that helps, and it helped me, is support. Mm. So I found a homeschool support group to join. Now, they did have a little drama at times. You have to ignore that and move on. People. Um, yeah, people. But they, they have been such a great source for sharing tips and tricks on how to do things, mm -hmm. um, sharing great resources. Here are some materials you might mm -hmm. want to check out. Mm -hmm. But also just joining forces as far as, you know, someone setting up field trips yeah. um, or classes or clubs. Mm -hmm. And my kids have done so many fabulous things that if it were just me alone would never have happened. Yeah. Um, it does help having others on the journey with you. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. And then to finish up, um, do you have any final tips or recommendations and what would you tell yourself back when you first started? Back when I first started, I'd say, you know, don't stress about it. Keep working slowly. Be like the tortoise, you know, mm -hmm. just keep slowly plodding. You'll get there. One of the things I tell um, people who are on the fence about whether to homeschool or not mm -hmm. is I've talked with thousands of homeschool families over the years. 
I have heard a lot of them regret not starting sooner. Mm. But I have never heard any of them, even the ones who quit after a while. Mm -hmm. None of them have said, I regret trying it. Mm. So that's what I tell people. It's there you scary. go. Give it a try. You can always go right. back, right? Exactly. Yeah. And don't, don't wonder what could have been. Just give it a try. Right. If you're thinking that, that that's something that you might want to do. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, any last words? tips recommendations for people well that's pretty much it it's just yeah. you know be willing to try it and if you get stuck somewhere you know you can always take a mental health day always yeah. call it a teacher work day and you take a day off I like that. You know? that's good. Um, <laughs> yeah rest is important right yeah i was homeschooled we were using curriculum that was from a public school Mm -hmm. uh, but I quickly discovered that I could do my lessons one day a week. Mm. The, the ones that we had in, in the books, because my mother would give me those weekly packets. Mm -hmm. And I quickly learned that she was going to bother me every day about those lessons unless I just took it on myself and I did the whole week on Monday mm -hmm. and I could do the whole week on Monday. Mm -hmm. um, and then she'd let me alone the rest of the week. <laughs> and so it doesn't take as much time as you think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it can be much less time and it's okay if you don't do it every day, mm -hmm. you take some days off and you'll yeah. be amazed at how much learning happens when you think you're taking time off. True. True. Wise words. That was a great episode. Many thanks again to Cheryl for sharing her experiences about lots of things, being very open about everything. Um, in the show notes, we will have resources and other things that may be of interest, resources and things that she has found um, to be helpful, as well as her book about her um, experiences growing up on, on, a, on a boat. Um, and if you have experienced homeschooling or would like to share it or know somebody who would be great to hear from, just go to our website, homeschoolsuccessstories.com, and um, you can sign up to be a guest or have your, um, very, your, have your friends sign up too. So anyway, we will see you next time. Bye. Bye.